Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, this week is uh, something like uh, British week in Korea University. Today, uh, Ambassador Scott Whiteman is uh, addressing you on the UK-Korea solving the fault lines in our global economy. It's a very exciting uh, topic. Uh, he will talk about the problems of global economy and how to solve uh, the problems uh, in cooperation between UK and Korea. And on Wednesday, uh, from five o'clock in the afternoon, there is coming a Minister of State of uh, Foreign Affairs Ministry of UK, uh, Jeremy Brown, and he is uh, giving a special lecture as well. So, so to speak, uh, we have uh, British Week uh, opening today, and I'm really very delighted and pleased uh, to have uh, Ambassador to open this uh, British Week. Uh, so, why don't you give a uh, big applause to welcome Ambassador of UK. Uh, well, uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, this afternoon, uh, and I'm very grateful for all of you uh, coming along to listen to me. Um, I, I appreciate very much the, the kind invitation that uh, you've made to me, and also your very warm welcome. Uh, I know that in the last uh, 10 years, under Professor Park Sung Hoon's direction, the Graduate School of International Relations has developed an international reputation for the quality of its teaching and its research. So I'm really delighted to have the chance to speak to you today and even more pleased that, uh, as we've just heard, the Minister of State, Jeremy Brown, from the Foreign and Commonwealth Office in London will be uh, here on Wednesday to deliver a lecture to mark the school's 10th anniversary. And to be honest, I can't think of a more fascinating time to be a student of international relations than now. Um, I studied French and European institutions at Edinburgh University a long, long time ago. Um, uh, and it was, uh, there was obviously international relations was uh, a part of the, the course that I studied. Uh, but the world then uh, looked very different from what it does now. And I, I think what makes it so interesting nowadays to be a student of international relations, frankly, is the uncertainty. Um, what we've seen in the last, <coughs> excuse me, in the last year We've seen seismic uh, changes in foreign affairs in the past year. We felt uh, the rise of the Arab Spring, which is arguably the most important social development so far in the 21st century. Uh, we had the death of Os Osama bin Laden, which struck a blow at the heart of uh, the Al-Qaeda terrorist network. In Libya, the UK helped to enforce a no-fly zone uh, with our NATO and Arab allies enabling the Libyan people to take charge of their own future, really for the first time uh, in decades. The recent North Korean leadership changes represent one of the most important developments in this peninsula in recent years. Elsewhere in Asia, the Burmese regime took encouraging first steps towards opening up and towards democracy. This year's already seen uh, a new president in Russia, or an old president in Russia, a once-in-a-decade leadership transition uh, in your neighbor, China. There'll be a presidential election, obviously, in the United States, and, of course, presidential elections here in South Korea, too. But running alongside these major political events, we've had two critical economic challenges continuing to face us following the two, uh, 2008's global, global financial crisis. The first challenge, how do we build a sustainable global economy? And secondly, how do we maintain and expand open markets and combat rising forces of protectionism? It's on these essential questions that I'd like to focus with you uh, today. And I'd be very happy to uh, engage in questions and answers uh, after I've spoken. I'll first outline how I hope Korea and the United Kingdom can work together in dealing with the risks still present in the global economy before setting out the concept of a partnership for growth for our two countries. My main message throughout, Korea and the United Kingdom have a vital role to play in working together in defending prosperity and in promoting global growth. But with less than 80 days to go before we host the Olympic Games in 
London. My uh, starting point is sport. This will be the third time that London hosts the Olympic Games. The last time was in 1948. In that year, London was still in the grip of post-wartime rationing. Building materials were a precious commodity, and the city still bore the scars of bombing raids. The athletes who took part in the Games in 1948 had to share a locker, uh, one between two. Uh, they each received a mirror and a water bottle and a bed, and that was it. Uh, they had to bring even their own food rations. When Korea hosted the Olympic Games 40 years later, it was ranked 40, the fifth, 45th largest economy in the world. GDP per capita stood at just over $3,000. So much has changed for our two countries in the intervening periods. Today, Korea and the UK stand proudly as the world's 12th and 7th largest economies. Over the last 50 years, the United Kingdom has been the second largest cumulative investor in Korea, and Britain attracts more Korean investment than any other country other than the United States and China. Trade between our two countries stands at nearly 10 billion pounds per annum. And let me reassure you that all the athletes, spectators, and dignitaries visiting London this summer will be well housed and well fed, and certainly better housed and better fed than they were in 1948. The, uh, we'll be serving up 14 million meals during the Games. This is the largest peacetime catering operation the world has ever seen, running from fish and chips all the way through to kimchi. <laughs> there are more than one million hotel rooms, from deluxe five-star suites to budget rooms where our visitors can rest at the end of a day of sightseeing, shopping and enjoying the Games. Our government has invested over $6.5 billion in uh, pounds rather, in transport to ensure people get to where they need to go and that the country keeps moving at the same time. And these will be truly green Olympics and Paralympic Games with a focus on carbon neutral neutrality and sustainability embedded across all of the planning for the Games. All of these phenomenal changes, be it the Olympics or the wider economy, have ultimately been driven out of the desire of our people to have a better life and to leave our children with more than we were born with. And this has been possible because of global trade and the sharing of new ideas. Yet current economic hardships and election cycles have led some to question the benefits of open markets. It's true to say that the global financial crisis damaged virtually every country. In 2009, Demand in the world's major economies fell relative to its pre-crisis trend by around two and a half trillion dollars, or five percent of GDP. What fueled the financial crisis? There were, of course, many factors, but I want to focus on what I see as being the primary cause, and that was the global imbalances that existed in the global economy at the time. Global imbalances are a reflection of today's decentralized interna international monetary and financial systems. All the main players around the world are rationally pursuing their own self-interest. But the financial crisis has revealed that what makes sense for each player individually does not always make sense in aggregate. Individual, rational actions had collective consequences in 2008. The main lesson for, for the coming from the crisis is the need to find better ways of ensuring the right collective outcomes. Improved financial regulation will be essential to this. It will help to intermediate the flows associated with the global imbalances. But the global economy will remain vulnerable to the risks, as risks associated with imbalances if they are not tackled at source. Discussions should focus on the underlying disagreement about the right speed of adjustment to the real pattern of, of spending and hence the reduction in these imbalances. This discussion should be informed by countries' ability to follow that path in a sustainable way. The G20, as the world's premier economic forum, has a fundamental role to play. Korea and the United Kingdom have cooperated closely in the G20 in the last three years. And that cooperation was essential to the success of the G20 summit in Seoul in 2010. Now, 
we must push together for effective coordination between countries to implement the Action Plan for Growth and Jobs agreed at the Cannes Summit, which commits countries to undertake specific actions in order to maximise overall growth in the world economy. If global agreement is not reached, at best there will be a weak world recovery. At worst, the seeds of the next financial crisis will be sown. As well as the need for greater global collaboration, the global economic crisis has highlighted weaknesses in the growth model of many developed countries, including the United Kingdom. The weight of the debt built up in the boom is being felt across much of Europe. The Eurozone crisis is affecting confidence across the world, including in Korea and the United Kingdom. I want to provide reassurance that Britain is tackling all these problems head on as far as we can nationally. Britain emerged from the crash with one of the largest fiscal deficits in the developed world. But our government is reducing our deficit with a strong, credible and comprehensive deficit reduction plan. The UK government is also acting to boost growth in the short and long terms. A national infrastructure development programme will see £250 billion worth of mostly private investment in low carbon infrastructure in the UK in the next five years. The government is reforming welfare entitlements, removing regulation, making it easier to employ people and create businesses, overhauling education, reducing our corporate taxes to some of the lowest in the world and championing within the European Union a deepening of the world's largest single market and leading across the world the cause of greater free trade. Throughout the crisis, we've been clear with Euro area partners on what needs to happen to resolve the Eurozone sovereign debt crisis. Eurozone members must end the uncertainty about Greece. They have to ring fence other vulnerable Euro area member states and they must proper, properly recapitalize Europe's banks. At the same time, several European governments need to be taking steps like the UK government to boost the competitiveness of their economies. Some progress has been made, but significant risks remain. We want the euro area to sort out its problems because a strong and stable euro area is in the United Kingdom's national interest because of our close economic links with our European partners. More than 40% of UK exports go to countries in the, UK, in the euro area. The economic crisis has had an additional knock-on effect and that's the acceleration in the shift of economic power to this part of the world, to Asia. Asia is now the beating heart of global growth, and we want to be a part of that success. Britain's Foreign Secretary, William Hague, set out in Singapore last month that Britain is looking east as never before. To match our ambition, Britain's Foreign Ministry is shifting staff out of embassies in Europe and expanding our network of embassies and consulates in Asia. By 2015, we will have put 120 extra staff into Asia, including new staff in our embassy here in Seoul, and also new staff in our embassy in Pyongyang. This leads me on to my first real theme, how I hope Korea and Britain can work together to address the outstanding fault lines in the global economy. First, we need, to resist, uh, we need to resist a return to protectionism. The December World Trade Organization ministerial meeting last year highlighted that the Doha development round of trade liberalization negotiations is blocked. We need to look at new and innovative alternative approaches to taking forward trade liberalization consistent with WTO rules. That means continuing to push ahead with ambitious free trade agreements with key partners. This is in part why the EU-Korea Free Trade Agreement, launched last July, the world's second largest bilateral free trade agreement, is so important. It also means that the UK and Korea must lead by example. In both our markets, we need open global trade, a stable and sustainable regulatory environment greater business openness and transparency. That is what the UK off, uh, offers foreign investors and it, what, uh, it is what makes London the world's leading financial centre. 
And these are pledges that the United Kingdom makes to the Korean government and to Korean business. And I know that in Korea we have a close partner in this respect. Secondly, we must ensure that a reformed and more representative international mon monetary fund has the tools and resources to do its job. The UK was one of the first countries to ratify the reforms agreed at the Seoul G20 summit in 2010. Those reforms will ensure the IMF is more representative of its whole membership. The IMF doesn't belong to any one region or group of economies in the world. Its role is to support countries which get into difficulty, not to support currencies. Its resources should be drawn from its members and available to all on an equal basis. But its members also have a responsibility to ensure that the IMF has the resources it needs to promote the global economic stability from which we all benefit. Thirdly, we must also ensure global capital markets are underpinned by global rules for financial regulation enforced by strong global institutions. Korea and Britain share an interest in a truly global approach to financial regulation that maximizes the benefits while reducing the risks of open market financial markets. At the heart of these new global rules are the Basel III prudential requirements for banks, which must now be rigorously implemented across the globe. Lastly, we have to shift current patterns of production and consumption so our citizens can live decent lives through the century. Both of our, both of our governments acknowledge that the energy intensive, high carbon growth of the past is unsustainable. President Lee myung bak recognized this truth when he proposed for the first time at the Toyako G8, G8 summit in 2008, an international commitment to green growth. That same year, the UK's Climate Change Act became law. This was the world's first legally binding national framework to reduce carbon emissions. Under the Act, the UK has to reduce its emissions by 34% by 2020 and 80% by 2050 against 1990 levels. In Korea, you've just passed hugely important national emissions trading legislation that will incentivize industry to reduce its impact on climate change. Transforming our economies isn't going to happen overnight. It's a tremendous challenge. We need to make a radical shift in investment from high carbon business as usual to the low carbon economy. But with this challenge also comes opportunity. The, low, the global low carbon market is worth more than $4 trillion and is projected to grow at 4% a year for the next five years. Already it supports 900,000 jobs in the UK. So be it in fighting protectionism or strengthening our global institutions, pushing for consistent global financial regulation and shifting to a low carbon economy, I know that Korea and the United Kingdom can lead the global debate. Taken together, these long lasting reforms will make global finance and trade a force for good rather than a source of instability, intermediating to put to work the savings of millions to create new jobs and new investments for millions more. I remain optimistic about the future for a strong, more sustainable global economic order, but it won't be easy getting there. This brings me to my second theme today. What should the United Kingdom and Korea relations look like under this strengthened global economy? Our shared past is a strong guide to our future. The UK and Korea share well over 100 years of friendship and our relationship is dynamic and vibrant. Over a thousand British service personnel gave their lives to defend Korea in its darkest days. We have supported and encouraged the development of the advanced democracy that the Republic of Korea has become today. We have given unwavering support to the Republic of Korea in face of provocations from the north. And our armed forces are working together to bring peace and stability to Afghanistan and fight piracy off Somalia today. So our relationship goes way beyond trade, important though that is, to a shared outlook and a shared understanding of our global interests and responsibilities based on shared political and economic, economic values. And my ambition for my stay in Korea is to see a step change in our relations, re relations, to see an even stronger relationship between our two countries. 
And at the heart of these strengthened relations must lie greater prosperity and well-being for the people of both of our countries. I think that the United Kingdom is a very strong offer to make to Korea. We're home to some of the world's largest pharmaceutical firms like GlaxoSmithKline and AstraZeneca. We're known for excellence in insurance, banking and accountancy services through companies such as HSBC, Prudential, Barclays and Standard Chartered. Many of you will have travelled as tourists to Britain and this year will be particularly spectacular to be in the UK as we host the, the Olympics and the Queen's Diamond Jubilee celebrations. And if you're flying to the United Kingdom, take a look at the wings of the Airbus planes which are made in North Wales and the Rolls-Royce engines assembled in Dar Derby in the north of England which is keeping the plane in the sky. Your in-flight entertainment will undoubtedly be playing British music from Adele to Coldplay, the Beatles to Amy Winehouse, and you'll be perhaps watching British films, whether it's James Bond or Harry Potter. But if you prefer to play with your Samsung Galaxy smartphone, that's fine. But while you're doing it, reflect that it contains microprocessors designed by Britain's ARM, and many of the apps and games that you'll be playing will have been created in one of the clusters of small, young, high-tech companies around the United Kingdom. For Britain is one of the top 10 manufacturers in the world. It has four of the world's top 10 universities, 19 out of the world's top 100. It's truly a global hub for creativity, as well as being a global financial centre. People tend to forget that in the UK, creative industries actually cr uh, represent a larger share of our nation's wealth than do financial services. But the UK must continue working hard to remain competitive in the world. To this end, our recent budget agreed to cut corporate corporation tax to 22% by 2014. This will mean that we will have the most competitive tax system for businesses of all the major established economies. The government has set out ambitious infrastructure and energy programs to grow the economy, understanding that austerity on its own is not enough. There are many exciting opportunities for Korean businesses and business and investment in the fields of construction, offshore wind, nuclear and smart grids. All of this helps explain why the United Kingdom remains the preferred destination for Korean European headquarters, with more Korean companies choosing the UK than the rest of Europe combined. Beyond bilateral trade and investment looms an increasingly interesting opportunity for win-win partnerships on projects in third countries. A good example of the scale of this opportunity can be found in Abu Dhabi where the KEPCO consortium was selected to build four nuclear power plants at a cost of 20 billion US dollars. And already seven UK firms have put themselves in the right place at the right time to contribute to the delivery of this flagship Korean project. Beyond trade and commerce, our two countries exchange ideas and culture. And it's the free flow of people and ideas that keeps our two nations close and provides strong bonds between open societies. I want to see more UK exchange students and academics coming to Korea for both a cultural and business education. And I want to see their Korean counterparts heading for the UK. Korea University is a, a leader in this regard. Membership of Universitas 21 and other exchange partnering programs is internationalizing this campus. Research links in the neurosciences between Korea University and Nottingham University in the UK are breaking new ground. But it's my belief that the potential in this area, even for Korea University and its UK partners, has not yet been fully realized. Korea and Britain should be natural destinations for study for any ambitious British and Korean student or researcher, not just for the brave-hearted. UK academics gaining Korea University research tenure and securing Korean research grants should be much more common. Student programs overseas should be the norm rather than the exception. We need to work together to make these things happen now. We hope that ongoing discussions will lead to more student and academic traffic in both directions. As well as education, sport links people too. Park Ji Sung's central role at Manchester United is a prime example of this, even if it didn't quite work out this last weekend. 
And I have to say, personally, I'm quite pleased about that. I'm excited that Sunderland for the English Premier League will be in Korea in July to take part in the Peace Cup. Sport was also at the heart of the recent visit of our Deputy Prime Minister Nick Clegg to Seoul in March. He met Prime Minister Kim Hwang Sik to witness the signing of a host-to-host -host agreement to facilitate links between London and Pyeongchang. And we'll look to share ideas, best practice, and business ahead of the Winter Olympics and the other major sporting events taking place in Korea over the next four or five years. And this brings me back to where I started, the power of the Olympic Games. I know Great Britain and Korea will be fierce competitors in the Olympic arena, be it Taekwondo, athletics or swimming. But sports field aside, our relationship is strong. It's naturally strong. Both countries have an important role to play in solving the fault lines in our global economy. We share common economic values and create new, exciting business opportunities together. We share culture and ideas. Many of you represent the future generation of Korean leaders. So I hope that you will share my enthusiasm for this important bilateral relationship and will help me take it forward to a new level in the years to come. Thank you very much. So, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, despite his very busy schedule, uh, Ambassador Whiteman will uh, remain us or stay with us for about 10 minutes to 15. So, uh, he will be ready to have uh, interaction with you. Uh, why don't you raise some comments or questions, please? <coughs> Uh, thank you so much, His Excellency the Ambassador. Uh, my name is Jimmy Chigoze. I come from Uganda in the east of Africa, where once a British colony. Yeah, uh, you talked about uh, Britain uh, pushing for trade liberalization, which is consistent with World Trade Organization. But when I look at the common agricultural policy, it basically uh, deters uh, importation of, of, of agricultural products into the European Union, uh, which, which products are basically, uh, many of the developing countries depend on agriculture. But then they are not able to sell their produce to, 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 to Europe. Secondly, as a result of surplus, many of these products are at the end dumped still in the developing countries, making uh, them look cheaper. So the local producer in, in, in the developing country is denied market abroad and also domestic market. So in your opinion, don't you think for developing countries to really come up, develop their economies, the common agricultural policy should break? Thank uh, you. Uh, I hesitate to say break, but reform, yes, absolutely. No, I th uh, absolutely, your analysis um, I would agree very much with. Um, for we had an election in the UK in uh, 2010 and we moved from a, a left of centre government, a Labour government, to a right of centre coalition government involving this, the Conservative Party and the Liberal Democratic Party. But one of the consistent themes um, of British policy um, uh, across governments uh, has been in relation to uh, the World Trade Organization um, negotiations and in particular the Doha development round. We have been uh, absolutely strong, the strongest uh, and most consistent uh, developed nation arguing that the Doha development round had to address uh, the, uh, the requirement to open up developed markets and emerging country markets to uh, the least developed countries. Um, and it's been one of our great frustrations that because of the blockages in other aspects of the negotiations, particularly uh, relating to some of the market access issues between countries like Brazil, the United States and the European Union, that's prevented a global agreement that would have opened up uh, mar more markets for developing countries. Um, so, you know, that's one point. On the common agricultural policy uh, for decades, um, the United Kingdom has been arguing for reform of the, of the policy. Um, and I think it's fair to say that some progress has been made in the last 10 or 15 years. There are fewer incentives now than there were in the past for European farmers to uh, overproduce. Um, there are fewer um, real subsidies for production. Um, 
there is continuing financial support for European farmers, but that support now is directed much more at environmental sustainability. Um, but uh, we will continue, the United Kingdom will certainly continue to advocate in negotiations in Brussels that um, the European Union needs to open up without conditions uh, its uh, market to agricultural imports from developing countries because I mean, we're, we're, the UK is a significant bilateral aid donor. Um, we're committed by 2013 to be uh, spending 0.7% of our gross national income on development spending. Uh, and that will help some developing countries. But the, the, the best way to help developing countries uh, uh, grow their economies sustainably is precisely to uh, make sure that they become integrated and part of uh, global trade. Um, and that means uh, opening markets. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, under the current uh, legal framework of climate change, both UNA, uh, UNFCC and Kyoto Protocol are not enough approaches to face climate change and green growth globally. So taking into account the United, uh, United Kingdom world leadership in low carbon development, do you think it is necessary to start a global discussion for adopting low carbon development strategies in a post-2012 climate change regime? Uh, yes, <laughs> uh, that's the short answer. I mean, there are two, in a sense, I think there are two issues. One is the international um, uh, negotiation around the post-Kyoto framework. Um, uh, how do we follow up the agreements that were reached in Durban at the UN uh, COP uh, conference of parties in Durban in December and make a reality of some of the commitments that were made by all uh, parties to the negotiations then. Um, but separate to that, and although it's linked, um, is, is this idea of restructuring the global economy, uh, which requires individual nations uh, but also a collective effort um, to decarbonize the world's economy. And that's a huge challenge because it needs to be done in a way which doesn't um, deprive uh, developing and emerging economies, doesn't deprive them of the opportunity uh, to, to grow uh, and to pull their populations out of poverty. Um, we uh, in the United Kingdom and I think more broadly in the European Union uh, for the last few years there has been a clear determination that we should shift our economy, uh, that we should shift the, 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 the nature of our economy. So the European Union has established some very ambitious targets uh, for 2020 to reduce carbon emissions and to increase the proportion of electricity that's generated through renewable sources. Uh, but what we also need to do internationally is to uh, uh, reach understandings that will create new financial frameworks that will enable uh, uh, significant flows of money uh, to come from the developed world into the developing world that will enable uh, poorer countries and the emerging economies to make the shift as well to low carbon growth. Um, uh, the, the view of the UK, uh, the UK government is that the best means of achieving that is through the establishment of some sort of global price for carbon. Uh, but that's, uh, uh, achieving that is, is a huge challenge. Um, but I think there are other things that can be done to help uh, individual countries develop policy frameworks that will incentivize the shift to low carbon economy. Um, and the uh, initiative that the Korean government took to establish the Global Green Growth Institute, which later this year will become uh, an international organization, um, is one such example. Uh, thank you. Um, as a member of the United Nations, the potential exists for the UK to be a sending state in the event of conflict on the Korean Peninsula. With uh, such military commitments, potential military commitments in mind, and the ongoing troop presence uh, of the United Kingdom in Afghanistan, do you think England should relook its military budget cuts and perhaps increase defense spending? Uh, that's a uh, really interesting question. Um, the fact is that we, uh, 
as, as I said earlier, we emerged in the global financial crisis with the largest fiscal deficit uh, amongst all of the developed uh, countries. And uh, the UK's future economic health depends on uh, returning credibility and uh, uh, control uh, over the public finances. And the government has a very clear strategy to achieve that. Part of that strategy involves very difficult choices about um, where cuts in public expenditure are going to be, have to be made. And those are shared across different government departments, including uh, cuts that uh, are necessarily being taken by our Ministry of Defence. And the fact is that our um, commitments in Afghanistan will begin to reduce from 2014 in line with the agreements that have been reached by all of the um, ISAF nations. Um, uh, that will create some uh, increased flexibility for our armed forces to respond to uh, other challenges and other requirements. Um, the, uh, the, the government, the UK government though, will remain absolutely committed to the concept of the UK having um, a global security role. And because we are a trading nation, uh, a nation whose wealth depends on international trade, uh, we have an interest in, we have security interests across the globe. What happens on this peninsula uh, is of vital economic interest to the UK. Uh, and that's why, one why uh, the government's commitment to, uh, to maintain prosperity and peace. Okay, uh, <clears throat> on this side, nobody, then you. Uh, thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, my question has to do with um, the UK's uh, position uh, when it comes to the Syrian uh, conflict and as well with uh, the issues in Bahrain. I ask this because um, the UK played a very important role in Libya and for which the Libyan people are very grateful. But uh, when it comes to Syria and Bahrain, uh, it's, the UK is quite quiet. And I just want to know uh, what the UK's position is on these two, Syria and, and Bahrain. Uh, I don't think we have been quiet. Um, uh, in the case of uh, Syria, both the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary and other ministers have been very vocal um, in their absolute condemnation of the uh, persecution by the Assad regime of its population. We have pushed for, uh, uh, we've, we've pushed in the Security Council for the UN Security Council to take a strong, robust stand uh, in relation to Syria, and we've been giving very strong backing to uh, Kofi Annan and his efforts to uh, broker, uh, broker a solution to the standoff between the Syrian people uh, and the Syrian leadership. Um, unfortunately, in the Security Council, it's, been, it's, been, it's not been possible so far to get agreement because the Chinese government and the Russian government in particular um, have been blocking um, more robust, or a more robust position. We cannot pretend, additionally, that anything other than that um, the, the situation in Syria is uh, even more complicated uh, and complex than was the situation in, in Libya. And that, I think, necessarily has, uh, means that there are fewer options for the international community <coughs> Uh, in the way in which it, it tries to uh, manage, the, the, manage the problem in Syria. Uh, but the, the, the position of our government is clear. Uh, the Assad regime um, has to uh, listen to what its people are saying. It has to uh, take immediate actions to end the violence uh, and the killing of ordinary uh, Syrians. Um, and uh, it has to reach a political settlement uh, that involves the opening up in a transparent way of Syrian society and, and, and the Syrian um, political system. Um, in the case of Bahrain, 
Britain. Uh, we have uh, made representations to the Bahraini government about uh, the need to observe uh, international standards of human rights in relation to its treatment of its population. Um, uh, the, uh, we had to mount a, a, an operation last year to uh, enable our citizens, some of, a lot of our citizens who were resident in Bahrain, uh, to leave the country when, uh, when the situation was at its worst. Um, and I think we're very clear that um, in Bahrain, as in uh, other countries, uh, the more that one, uh, that a, a government um, engages with its people, um, uh, seeks to understand the underlying uh, reasons for discontent um, the better placed it will be to uh, address uh, the, uh, the problems in that society and bring uh, greater stability. But I think the, I mean, the, the level of violence that we're seeing in Syria, as opposed to the, the level of um, uh, disorder or uh, protest that there is in Bahrain, are, are at quite different positions on, on the scale. So, Ambassador, can you say a few words about the uh, upcoming Wednesday event, special lecture by Jeremy Brown? Yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, Jeremy Brown, is, uh, he's a member of the coalition government. He's uh, a member of the Liberal De Democratic Party, so the minority party in, um, in, the, uh, in the coalition. Um, he visited Korea in July last year. It was his first visit. Um, and he, uh, he left Korea um, very, very enthusiastic. Um, he's uh, now become a sort of passionate advocate in London with his ministerial colleagues about the opportunities that he sees for our bilateral relationship and the opportunities that he sees for British business here. Um, and so he was very keen to uh, return to Korea uh, within a year uh, and he will be spending two or three days here. Uh, he's got meetings, uh, a number of meetings here in Seoul uh, and then he will be going down to Daejeon um, uh, uh, as well, uh, so that he can see something outside Seoul, it's Seoul City. Uh, but he is greatly looking forward to the opportunity to come here uh, to Korea University. Um, and he, uh, he will be talking about the, the sort of example that uh, Korean development provides to uh, the rest of the world and the, the success story uh, that Korea is and what, what we can all learn from it, uh, not just um, uh, uh, not just uh, develop, uh, least developed countries, not just emerging economies, uh, but also uh, the developed countries as well, including the United Kingdom. So it's that sort of thing that he'll be discussing. And uh, if you are here, he will be uh, he, he will love as well having a very uh, free flowing question and answer session as well. So I hope as many of you as possible will uh, will be able to come along to that. So it was uh, Ambassador's personal invitation to you all to attend the Wednesday meeting, okay? Uh, Ambassador Whiteman, thank you very much for your very interesting and uh, very informative uh, speech. And uh, let's uh, keep in touch and I think uh, you will not, uh, it will not be the last time you will be here. I hope not. Uh, so, yeah. thank you very much. And I, I look forward to thank you. Thank you. Thank you.